California True Crime is a podcast that sometimes deals with heinous acts of violence towards other individuals. This podcast may not be suitable for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, and welcome to this bonus episode of California True Crime. I'm your host tonight, Sean. Tonight, only Charles will be with me. How are you, Charles? I'm doing good. Jessica was not able to make it to this one, but we will have her back soon. In this episode, it's it's kind of a holiday episode. To me, holidays are very special, and I hope everyone's staying safe and having some joy in this weird 2020. Now, there's been some tragedies that have happened right around Christmas that uh, they've been in the forefront more than others, such as the Lacey Peterson case or the Covina massacre. Something my co-host and I have talked about a lot, either on the episodes or off, for some reason some cases don't get the same national attention that others did. Though locally, this was a pretty big case. Um... It did have a little bit of national news, but locally, like in the news stations of NBC7 and ABC10 in San Diego, um, they covered this very thoroughly. I think I'm going to tell the story in some of of a chronological order of how the info and things played out in this case. Did you really know anything about this case before, Charles? No, I I had heard of you and and Jessica talking about it, but it wasn't one that uh, immediately leapt to the forefront. Right, yeah, with all those Christmas ones that... So I guess they're not really talked about that much as Christmas. They just happen around Christmas time. This was just one that neither was talked about or I heard about it anyway. Which is is interesting because it is a relatively uh, more recent case for us to to cover. Right. And there's a lot of weird turns that happen and Mm -hmm. it just seems like it would be out there more. On Christmas Eve of 2013, uh, the news was at the scene of the Macy's parking lot at the Westfield Mission Valley Mall around San Diego. In the early hours of December 24th, around 1.30 a.m., police arrived at a parking lot after a 911 call from a woman saying that she had been shot. For the extended holiday hours, Macy's was actually still open until 2 a.m. at this time. So I, I've never, I don't remember that happening much but for the holiday season i guess places do stay open yeah i I feel like the last you know i'd say the last five to ten years it seems like everything is staying open later and later i know you know with like black friday sales starting like on thanksgiving day and i think it just continued now i i think 2 a.m on christmas eve might be a bit excessive but yeah that's pretty late but yeah i maybe i just never paid attention because Mm -hmm. i've never postpone that much on christmas so not to two o'clock in the morning i have postponed things till 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 december 24th but when police arrived they found the woman dead in the car shot in the head and shoulder area and a man in the car also shot in the head and shoulder area but was still alive and they rushed him to the hospital from the ABC 10 broadcast, you can see the car that they were found in, and the passenger side window is shattered and has a bullet hole through it. They did not have really more info, except the police were wondering about a man who left in a gray-colored four-door Honda, which might have been in between the years of 2008 or 2011. The news broadcast goes on to let us know that Macy's will be open in 30 minutes and they are working on figuring out if this will affect holiday shopping. So this is the morning when the news was already giving this. So they're still taking care of a scene of a woman dead and a man critically uh, injured. And they're they're trying to get the information of will the mall open in 30 minutes for holiday shopping or I just find it odd yeah it's a big it's a bit ghoulish yeah and like how you said it's not christmas eve it's the eve of christmas eve so technically at 2 a.m it's christmas eve but you still have a whole nother day of shopping 
Oh, I see what you're saying. My yeah, I thought it was like Christmas Day at two two o'clock. So this is happening. Right. This is happening the earliest morning of the twenty fourth. Right. So it was technically the evening of the twenty third into the twenty fourth. Right. And so in the, that morning, then the news news coverage Christmas Eve morning. That's when they're covering. Okay. They're saying someone's murdered. Let me let you know in a little bit if the mall will open for right. you to do your, your shopping. last minute shopping. Right. By the evening, some witnesses had been talked to, such as the man sleeping in a trailer very close by. From what I gathered, he was with a Christmas tree lot in the parking lot. Mm. He said his dogs woke him up, but he really didn't see much. He didn't hear gunshots and talked about it might have been because of the caliber gun that was used. From the shell casings, they think it was uh, a twenty two or a twenty five used. You still think he might have heard that, you know, especially if it's a, if no one else is there at, at that early right. in the morning. The dogs seem to have heard it. They right. might have heard something else, like a, a scuffle or right. anything. But they took the man in the car to Scripps Mercy Hospital, where he was uh, at the ICU in critical condition. Who, by that evening, he was identified at, as Salvador Belvedere, who was 22 years old. The woman in the car was named Alona Flint, who was also 22 years old. Uh, Salvador was the brother of her fiancé, Gianni Belvedere, who was 24. Gianni and Alona had been dating for about eight years and were engaged to be married. Gianni Belvedere, actually, after this incident, he is now missing. So, Salvador Belvedere, Gianni's brother, is in ICU. Mm Mm-hmm. Alona Flint has passed away from her wounds, and now Alona's fiancé, Gianni, Salvador's brother, is missing. Uh, He was last seen hours before the 911 call. They were all originally from Utah, but when the Belvedere family relocated to San Diego, uh, Alona came along with them. They all grew up together and went to Walden School of Liberal Arts in Provo, Utah. Alona worked in the mall at at a shoe store, and it sounded like she didn't have a car. So either Gianni or Sal or other members of the family would pick her up after work. This doesn't take place in Provo, so we won't really talk about that much. But Charles is going to tell you a little more about the area around Mission Valley Mall. Yeah. uh, So to start out with, Mission Valley was actually the site of the first Spanish settlement in California established in 1769. So so the history of this this place really goes back to the the european founding of california uh westfield mission valley formerly known as mission valley center is a retail complex consisting of a traditional open air shopping mall and a power center uh, in mission valley san diego it was originally owned by uh unibail radamaco westfield uh, the traditional outdoor mall is anchored by Target, Bed Bath & Beyond, and Macy's uh, Home and Furniture Stores. There's a Michael, a Nordstrom's Rack, a Bloomingdale's Outlet Store, and an AMC Theaters. Uh, while one major anchoring building originally uh, was the May Company, it's most recently Macy's is now vacant. The power center across Mission Center Road is anchored by a big box retailer, uh, DSW Shoes, West Elm, Old Navy, uh, a Trader Joe's, and a Marshalls. Um, the term power center was interesting to me. I, I think I, lo- I tried looking it up and seeing it used in ch- conjunction with shopping malls. I believe the power center is another name for these enclosed malls. So this mall is, is kind of expansive. It's consisting of two different sections, an open air, more like a Zocalo or like a Galleria, and then this, this enclosed area. Uh, in June 1958, the San Diego City Council unanimously voted in favor of rezoning 90 acres for a proposed mall. Uh, there was a great deal of controversy uh, involved with this uh, May Company shopping center plan. A lot of the citizens in the area didn't want to see the pristine Mission Valley uh, inundated with suburbanization. So the San Diego downtown merchants were not pleased either. They saw this huge suburban retail center as potentially siphoning off a lot of customer base from uh, the downtown area, which is I know is always a concern. Uh, having listened to uh, one of my favorite podcasts, The History of Malls, talks a lot about what can come when these, these malls come into these areas. 
However, by 1959, the mall was under construction and completed in late 1960 with a grand opening on February 20th, 1961. It was designed by the San Diego-based architectural firm uh, uh, Dems Lewis. The mall contained two large anchor spaces occupied by the Montgomery Ward and May Company, uh, 70 inline stores, as well as a large central courtyard. The mall was designed with stores on the levels above the parking garage, which I thought was kind of cool. It, it's not necessarily... I don't often see around here malls where the parking is underneath the mall itself. I thought that was kind of unique. And and that really has to do with the idea that the, where this mall is located, it's located on a floodplain. So the idea was if we build it, the mall with the parking garage under, if flooding happens, it'll go and it will flood the parking garage and the stores and the retail areas will be safe. So it was uh, actually San Diego's second mall following the opening of College Grove Center in 1960. The mall underwent its first big expansion in 1975. There was a a new three-story Bullocks uh, that was built there. In 1983, the mall underwent a significant remodel. Uh, This helped to mitigate the effect of a Mexican economics crisis uh, crisis and a peso devaluation called Ley Decada Perdida. And I found this interesting because of where San Diego is and its pro- proximity to, to the border of Mexico, Mexican customers who actually made up 15% of sales to this mall were able to obtain fewer dollars with their pesos and thus had less to spend. So because of, uh, and, and this has, there's a long history of this crisis in, in Mexico at the time where the peso was incredibly devalued and, and Mexico was going through kind of an economic crisis. Well, that meant that the people that were coming over across the border to shop and spend tons and tons of money at this local shopping establishment thereby investing way more money into into the San Diego area, had less capital to spend, which really hurt the local economy of San Diego. So I, I again, it's that, it, to me, that was kind of interesting. That is, yeah. Um, uh, in 2001, the mall's original tenants, a Montgomery Ward, which I thought was kind of cool. You don't see too many more. I mean, Ward's is now bankrupt. Well, but it's actually still online. Right, they have it online, but in in 2001, this was the original one of the original stores that opened the mall in 61. Um, it was shuttered because the chain went bankrupt, and then, like yeah. you said, went turned back online because it's uh, because of its age and its architectural design. 2015, the city of San Diego concluded that the the building actually met several criteria for qualification for the San Diego Resources Register. And and it's that's really kind of like a local historical landmark registry. They pointed to the fact that it was a center of cultural and community development, and it had an identifiable architectural style. The problem was is the building didn't qualify because of the lack of integrity of original construction because it had been renovated so many times and the original facade, in fact, there was no real identifying original markers. So the registry said in good faith that we couldn't do it. But I thought it was interesting that they were trying to, you know, put that for a mall. In in August of 2008, the, the Westfield Group filed an application for a major renovation to the Westfield Mission Shopping Center. They, what they envisioned was a 500,000 square foot expansion of retail space for stores. 50,000 w- square feet would be for commercial space, ad- adjacent condominiums, and parking. So they really wanted to, like, kind of, I won't say gut this entire area, but really build it back up with houses, you know, like the, the like the, sometimes you see some of these like open air Galleria malls, and they have the the really nice condominiums around them. Parking, they want to, they kind of want to revitalize this area. The real estate industry experts expected this project to be a really long term and big development to last somewhere between five and ten years. However, by 2018, no renovations had been done to the Valley Shopping Center. And I, I didn't find if the funding fell through or they couldn't get backers, you know, or the city itself kind of put a kibosh on it. But as you were saying, I can see, you know, it, this seems like a really big place that has gone through some hard times. And, and I did look up the town itself. I just pulled up their, their Wikipedia and they, they really are. Mission Valley really is a shopping center. I mean, it is, that's their, I won't say their claim to fame, but it's apartments and mall. Oh, okay. Thank you. By the day after Christmas on December 26th, the family held a press conference outside of the San Diego Police Department. 
What they mainly focused on was Johnny was still nowhere to be found. Uh, They pleaded for him to come home, that they needed him right now. At this point, no one really knew anything about Gianni as to where he was. What Was he there or not? Uh, did he have anything to do with this? But all of a sudden, he is missing. So the thoughts must – they must have just been out of control for both the family, friends, and law enforcement. He's just – after all this and then, the, you know, your other family member is just – is gone. Well, and, and in Lou, I, can't, I can only imagine – the thoughts that might be running through some of the family and friends where you have two loved ones killed and the third one's gone. I'd hate to say it, but I think, I think my immediate reaction would be, well, did he do it? Is he involved? Right. And I think that's, yeah, I think, I think that's just everyone Mm -hmm. thinking that not just family, like people reading the story and it's just because there's not many clues. Right. Police have no motives at this point at all. Um, police are also, at this time, they put out a bulletin that has a, a $1,000 re- reward for finding Gianni. On the flyer, uh, the info had that he might be driving a 2004 gr- uh, dark green Toyota Camry with Utah plates. And and you said earlier there was a – the police were looking for somebody with a a Honda – Right, it's a dark gray Honda, either a 2008 to 2011. So it's a totally different car. So I think they were going off of witness statements um, from the mall that night. And now this is, they can't find Gianni, so this is what he would have been driving. Oh, it's his car, okay. On December 27th, Salvador Belvedere passed away from his wounds. On the news after he died, Sal's cousin Paul Donato said that Sal's organs had been donated. He said, quote, he was a special person and anyone who knew him knew he had a big and loving heart. But even through this tragedy, his precious heart beats in someone else. At this point, which is about four days after all this uh, and with Gianni missing, people are starting to make their own assumptions. The news was throwing out there. They weren't sure if Gianni was the murderer or the victim. Then they start doing their sleuth work and see a post from Sal's sister on his Facebook over a year before all this happens that says, quote, we are planning your funeral, unquote. That, and that's just all it says on his page. I mm-hmm. mean, if you saw, saw that, sure, you can speculate all you want, but it could be also absolutely anything of an inside joke or a conversation that was going on at the time. Like, for example, the same day that his sister posted that, it was Thursday night football between Seahawks and 49ers, which is both West Coast teams. There's a uh-huh. team with rivalries. They could, I think putting that on the news was just, I felt that was kind of just reckless. Yeah, it's like you're trying to invent a story that may or may not be there. But like you said, yeah, I could see somebody like if you and I were betting on a, on a football game. And I, I'm, I would might post that something like that on a social media thread and saying, oh, you know, I'm planning your funeral, Sean, meaning, I, you know, my team will. Yeah, it could have been anything, it, you know, but right. just to, to not have any context of what it mm-hmm. meant and then to put that on the news. That's just to me, it was it was a lot. Right. The next night, a candlelight vigil was held for Alona Flint at the La Jolla Shores, a place that she loved. And on January 1st, a candlelight vigil was held for Sal at Crystal Piers. Um, Sal used to love going there and surfing. At this vigil, it was announced that the reward fee for Gianni had been raised to $10,000. And by this point, we're only a little over a week or so af- after the, the shooting. The police are still, even when this with this ten thousand dollar reward, the the police are still saying Gianni's not. I mean, they're not saying one way or the other. Just saying we're just we're continuing. We want we want to find him. We need your help. That kind of stuff. Yeah, they haven't changed anything from the initial, except that he's a a missing missing person. Missing person. Yeah. Okay. Two weeks into this case, everyone was still looking for answers. Pretty much any answers. They still had no motive in anything, and the only thing that they were saying at the time was that it does not appear to be tied to robbery. On January 7th, Lieutenant Mike Hastings gave a press conference saying this was 
one of the most unusual cases he had seen in 20 years. He also said that Gianni's cell phone or credit cards have not been used since the incident. At this point, Gianni is considered a missing persons, and no one really thinks he did anything. I mean, friends and family don't think he did anything. They said that Gianni was extremely close to his brother and loved his fiance. But I mean, anyone else in public, they don't they don't know because they don't know the family. So it's like they're they're really the family keeps saying, you know, we don't think Gianni did anything. So they're the ones that are now are they saying so they're saying this publicly in the news and we don't think Gianni had anything yeah. to do with it? Okay. But as far as as far as the law enforcement goes, like you just stated they they're still not saying anything. He's just a missing person. We're not saying he did. We're not saying he didn't. We and just, we, and we don't think it's robbery. So they right. really don't know anything okay. or that they're saying. Now on January seventeenth. So this is quite a while after. But I mean, from December twenty third when it originally to January seventeenth, all hope was really wiped away when a woman in Riverside, California, which is about ninety minutes north in the Los Angeles area, called the police to report a car in a shopping center parking lot that had a foul odor coming out of it. This was a dark green 2004 uh, Toyota Camry with Utah plates, just like on the missing persons poster. When the police popped the trunk, they found a decomposing body inside. The next day, the family confirmed it was Gianni, and a week later, the police made it official after the autopsy. Uh, this now went from a double, double homicide and missing persons to a triple homicide. On January 24th of 2014, Lieutenant Mike Hastings again gives a press conference with a little more detail. They give a more in-depth description of who they are looking for, that the man may be in his early 20s, 5'10 to 6 feet tall, uh, in a black hoodie with white bands on the sleeves, tan pants, and all white, white shoes. I'm guessing that this is something um, to tell people not to look for now. Obviously, he's probably not going to mm-hmm. be wearing that. This is like to maybe jog their memory of the past if they happen to see anyone like that around that time. They also believe the suspect was at the mall, left, and came back later. The $10,000 reward Uh, was for finding Gianni. Now it's for the arrest and conviction of suspect or suspects who have killed all three. Things seemed to slow down for a while with really no new developments. Months went by with the news trying to keep it out there. I saw one thing that detectives visited the the Belvedere family restaurant called Otavo's. It's a an Italian restaurant, which looks pretty good uh, from what I've seen, and they're still open during COVID right now. We're doing takeout. What I think is really neat that is that after all this was going on, they changed their marquee for the restaurant, and it added two photos of Gianni and Sal on the marquee. And I, I don't know what, like when I first see it, it just looks awesome. It looks like a like an old Beastie Boys promo p- picture. They just look so rad <laughs> on the marquee. It's it's really cool. That does that does. It looks like a not a lo-fi, but like a minimalist poster. It looks yeah. really cool, Gianni and Sal. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. That's not and a, a, a nice way to honor your loved ones than to keep them, you know, keep them always there with you. Right. So when the detectives visited the restaurant, they released some info that Gianni had been shot. It wasn't until June 21st that something actually happened in the case. Carlo Mercado, 29, of Mira Mesa, was booked with three counts of first-degree murder. It was also found out at this time that Mercado had previous gun charges from May 5th that he had pleaded guilty to and was going to be sentenced to that in the near future. Mercado's lawyer at this time said Carlo had no involvement in these murders whatsoever. So that's pretty much all they announced that they arrested someone, not really too much more. Is it an appropriate thing to ask of like why Carlo Mercado? I mean, did they it, they just uh, out of the blue they they announced that they arrested that guy? Yeah, it was just pretty much out of the blue. They arrested him. They hadn't really said much. It gets explained but later. But yeah, it was just because like nothing was going on. Then they're like, hey, we got someone. 
when you say that, Sean, that that's interesting to me because it it's it seems like so out of the blue, like you know, weeks and weeks go by with nothing and everyone pleading, and suddenly uh, we've arrested somebody. And to me, that reminds me of a, of something that we've talked a lot about, where families and 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 people are might get angry or frustrated that but that the police aren't sharing things with the public. But part of that is because they're trying; they might be trying to build a case or do investigations. So it's a good reminder that even though we may not see stuff in the public going on with some of these cases, but that the co- that the cops or the police officers are actually you know doing their job. Right. I think a lot of times transparency is talked about with police, but that matters on certain things. And sometimes right. you just can't you can't show your whole hand when you're trying to work something as delicate as this. Right. Exactly. Hey, y'all. We are Wendy and Beth. She's Wendy and I'm Beth. And we want to tell you about a podcast that we host called Fruit Loops Serial Killers of Color. Fruit Loops is a podcast about true crimes committed by people of color and the victims that we don't hear or know much about. Contrary to popular belief, not all serial killers are straight, cisgender, white dudes. No, ma'am. Join us at Fruit Loops as we tell fascinating stories of true crimes committed by people of color and their victims that often go untold by the mainstream media. As we dive into these cases, we get into the historical and cultural context of the crimes and the criminals in order to get a sense of what might have influenced the perpetrators and led to the crimes. And that's right. New episodes drop every Thursday on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts from. So until then, look alive, y'all. It's crazy out there. On June 25th, Mercado was arraigned and pleaded not guilty. Each first-degree murder count holds a 25-to-life sentence, and because of it being three victims, the DA could ask to make this a death penalty case if it seems appropriate to everyone involved. Now, it wasn't until September 2nd that the preliminary hearings started, and we learned a lot more from what is going on. So let me try to go through all the details that I gathered. First off, homicide detectives tracked Sal and Alona's phone, and this is uh, what they gathered from this. Sal left his home and arrived at the mall parking lot around 12.45 a.m. I'm pretty sure Alona was already off work at this point. She tried to call Gianni five times with no answer. The last time she tried to call him was at 1.05 a.m. Also during this time, Alona was calling jails and hospitals looking for Gianni, so this tells me that It was supposed to be Gianni that was supposed to pick her up in the first place, it seems like. Mm -hmm. At 1.14 a.m., Alona called 911. Now, there is not much to the 911 call, but she is telling dispatch in a calm voice at first, quote, hi, I'm at the West Mission, and that's kind of as far as she got before she says, ow, ow, we've been shot twice. The dispatch then says, where are you? And she replies, at the Mission Valley Westgate Mall. After that, the dispatch asks more questions, but those were the last words from Alona. Gianni's phone was never found, but I guess a text was sent to Sal at 1.30 a.m. from his phone. But the detectives, they don't know who sent it. They didn't say what it said. His last phone call was to his cousin, and during the call, his cousin said that he seemed to be to become distracted, and then the call ended. So almost like maybe somebody was coming up on him. or Right, and then the cousin tried to call him back, and there was no answer. Oh. And then after that, the phone would be turned off. There was also some surveillance tapes from the mall in the parking lot. Alona walked out of the mall around 12.22 a.m., and an unidentified man was following her. Now, when they found Gianni in the trunk of his car in Riverside, they were able to collect a lot of evidence from this. In the trunk next to Gianni's body was a Febreze bottle. It was the kind that had the constant aerosol trigger on it. Uh, more okay. not yeah. on, not the top trigger, but like like what yeah, looks the, like a trigger. It said that the trigger was duct tape to be pushed uh, to the constantly be going. 
So as to as to mask the scent, right? And also, they found boxes of baking soda in the trunk. Oh, to absorb the odor. They were able to pull DNA that matched Mercado from the gas cap, a piece of duct tape that was on the license plate, and also from the duct tape used for the Febreze bottle. So he wasn't very careful. You're leaving a a car in a parking lot, probably obviously to be found, mm-hmm. but not for a while. But you still leave your DNA on it. It wasn't. It didn't seem very smart. Well, you you know you could make the argument that he came apro- came upon it and touched something on the outside. I think that that I believe that would be a little bit easier to explain, except for the DNA on the Febreze bottle that's duct taped inside. Right. Yeah, the gas that's cap. A, maybe a, you could even say, "Hey, I was stealing gas. I saw this yeah, car I was I siphoning stole. off a can of yeah. gas or something." But the, or, yeah, the duct tape in it. Yeah, that would be hard. Yeah, that'd be a lot harder. During this hearing, they discussed the circumstances about the weapons charges. I saw some conflicting things about this because one thing was a, it was a news anchor outside of the courtroom telling you something, but then an update article telling you something a little different. So I'm going to go off the updated article. On January 18th, the day after Gianni's body was found, uh, Mercado went through the U.S. Border Patrol I-5 checkpoint in San Clemente. Mercado told them that he that there was an AR-15 in a bag registered to him, and he was heading to San Bernardino to find a shooting range. They asked him why he's taking the I-5. He said he was heading to L.A. first. Now, in the other report that, that was on the live news person, it, it just said that he told him he was heading to L.A. to take a walk which I just found really weird since it was 4.30 in the morning, like when he's pulled over. So they didn't give all the information, and I'm like, what? (laughs) It was very odd. When the agents checked the bag, they found ammo, two loaded pistols, and magazines. There was also not in the bag, but in the center console, a homemade silencer that fit one of the guns perfectly. And I think this is why the man in the parking lot for the Christmas tree lot didn't hear the shots because the uh, Carlo Mercado used a silencer. In one article that I found, it said the guns were confiscated, but then Mercado was arrested for violation months later on April 29th, and then he was charged for these weapons uh, charges on May 5th. Another thing they brought up was that was Mercado's phone. In his phone that said he didn't use much and had a couple of it had a couple of odd things on it. For one, they found internet searches that had previously been erased from his phone. These searches included quote San Diego Mall shooting, Mission Valley Mall, and Mall shooting San Diego. There was also searches for San Bernardino National Forest shooting area and 1640 Camino del Rio North, which was near the mall. The other thing was that on his calendar on the phone, on the date of the murder that when it happened, he had wrote on the calendar RIP. All the other calendar dates around it just said payday, because I guess he worked at Target. That's a lot, that's a lot of, I won't say damning evidence, but it's a lot of circumstantial stuff. Yeah, a lot. You know, again, if you have the right attorney or... Uh, the defense attorney tried to put holes in the case, and one of, one of them seemed like a long stretch. I guess there were two employees who worked at Macy's, and when they left, they saw a man with blood on his forehead. I'm assuming they're talking about Sal and not a man leaving with blood on his forehead. I guess they gave a description of a man leaving, and they said he had curly hair. Uh, the defense tried to say that this looked more like Gianni than the suspect. Jessica has talked about multiple times about how eyewitnesses and memories, like how it can be really hard to, mm-hmm. to really make that stick. One thing the defense attorney said that was a stretch was that he was cross-examining the detectives on the stand, and he, he asked him if it's possible to commit suicide and then have someone put you in the trunk. Uh, the detective answered, it's possible, <laughs> because which we all know it's possible, but it just seemed like a very, it's like a big stretch in any case with this kind of evidence. They're trying to make some kind of argument that, you know, get that reasonable doubt going. Right. And again, you know, I, like you said, I think 
any, you know, there is a small, minute possibility that if I were to commit suicide in a car, somebody might come along and put me in the trunk. I would think what's more likely if somebody were going to do that is they would either A, steal the car, or B, steal all my stuff. Yeah, or you it know? was someone with them. Right, exactly. And then they exactly. freaked out thinking they'd right. be charged. But yeah, definitely. But it's just with all the other evidence, and then that was um, shown, like they showed it on the news. I just thought it was a little weird. Right. Now, there's one more thing I'd like to bring up from this. and. I, I want to bring up how it was presented, not in the hearing, but with the news. The defense brought up a possible motive that this was drug-related. In Sal's car, there was a bag of pills, which included Xanax. Pathologist Steve Campman testified that Alona's blood tested positive for metabolites for heroin, but they could not determine how much heroin or the last time it was used. Gianni had opiates alcohol, morphine, codeine, and Xanax in his body at the time that he died. Sal did not test for anything, and I saw that he had recently got out of a three-month rehab. So it's possible that they were recre. I mean, it's not possible. It seems like the evidence is pointing to them being recreational users. Right. They had also interviewed a drug dealer who said that Gianni was buying heroin from her for about five months until he was killed. Then in this article, it said that the detectives found no evidence that anyone owed any money to drug dealers, so a drug debt was out for being a motive altogether. Now, I understand this is the defense attorney trying to, you know, make a defense. The thing that bothered me when doing the research was one of the news teams made it a little over the top. I already brought up the Facebook thing earlier, how they were pulling what the sister said, and they didn't really know anything at the time. Mm -hmm. And the evening news was from the first night of the preliminary hearings. They start out by saying that they're still not knowing what the relationship or motive was between Mercado and the victim, but then going on to say, quote, we did learn that two of the victims were entrenched in the drug world. Both of them had drugs in their system when they were killed. I think just saying entrenched in the, in the drug world, it makes them sound like hardcore dealers, but there's no evidence. They just had an expensive habit. Then they go on through their segment, and they never come back at all about them being anything about drugs. Uh, the clip's about 2 minutes and 38 seconds. Um, so maybe they said it right after, but from this clip that they still have from the news station, mm -hmm. they make them sound like they're, they're like Scarface and then they don't go back to it at all. So I, I thought that was, I, it bothered me. Well, yeah, it's making something out of what the police have already discounted. Right. So I, I think it's misleading in that respect and you don't know the whole story. You know, it, it as you said. One of them had been just gotten out of rehab and didn't test positive at all. Yeah, I think it's it's it it smacks a little of um, sensationalism, right? And it's just hard because this is a long story. People are playing it out how it is, and just like you said, there's some things that are just a little over the top that I, mm -hmm. they could have just been reading the facts, and it's still a, a you know a, a terrible story. Well, and I, without a mention of what you just said. It smacks of sensationalism, especially after the police have said that there's no there's no link, you know, f for drugs to be an issue in this in this murder. Right. After all this evidence was presented, the judge ruled that Mercado will stand trial for the murders. Now, on September 17th, during arraignment. Mercado's public defender, Gary Gibson, said he didn't think his client was mentally competent. He will be evaluated, and then they will either set a new date or he goes to a hospital to restore his competency, which I didn't really think about that. Like, I didn't think about—I think about mental illness and you're not able to stand trial, but to me, I don't feel like it's like, oh, let's go check it out and make sure you're all right, you know, and— and get better. And that, it was just weird how it was presented. Yeah, I think I think that's a, a interesting point. And uh, Jessica talked about it uh, this this idea um, in a previous episode of a change where before you would be sent in, 
you know, because you weren't competent to stand trial and you could be held indefinitely. But because of due process, you need to be reevaluated. And and once you're evaluated to be able to stand trial, you need to, you know, go back in and go through the system again. So mm-hmm. I, I, I'm with you. It didn't, it's, it seems like an odd thing to think, well, look, we're going to send you to a hospital. Like, like that's easily curable too. I think that's the other side of it too, is that right. we have, we've talked about in certain episodes, the, the state of state mental care facilities for inmates being what they are. It, it's not, it doesn't give me a lot of faith sometimes reading some of these stories that somebody that goes into one of those institutions is getting the, the best care possible in order for them to be able to stand trial or to, or to help with the problems that they go in suffering. Right. And on November 3rd, Judge Joseph P. Brannigan f- uh, found Mercado not to be competent. Uh, three reports had come in on Mercado, two by a psychiatrist and one by a psychologist. The reports had diagnosed him schizo- with schizophrenia, psychotic, and suffering from catatonic depression. Uh, Mercado also attempted suicide. The judge said that Mercado must be treated at a state hospital for three years or until he fa- is found competent to assist in his own trial. From the news broadcast, they talk about how this is very rare to fake, or it's very hard to fake, and it's rare that the judge would allow it. They also said that this is all for the moment. Not that he was competent during the murders, but just for him to help with his his own trial. Right. And then you actually, because I, I was reading, like, we've talked about schizophrenia and other things. One that I don't think we've talked about is catat- catatonic depression, and you have a little information on that? Yeah, I, I think if you're listening to this, you know, depression is kind of a common term. I think it's used a lot and catatonia or, or being in a catatonic state. I didn't really understand too well um, the combination, like what is catatonic depression? And even though Jessica couldn't be with us tonight, she did uh, do some research and, and uh, gave me some crib notes to to bring me up to speed. So catatonic depression is depression, which we're all more familiar with now the idea of loss of interest in activities of life, uh, a deep abide, uh, abiding sadness, trouble sleeping, eating, and etc. Irritability, difficult thinking, focusing thoughts on, uh, about uh, constant thoughts about suicide, uh, with a diagnosis of catatonia as well. Now, catatonia it used to be uh, solely associated with schizophrenia but now has its own entry in the DSM and can be igni- diagnosed on its own. So it's, it's really looking at something that uh, a form of, of mental illness that used to be associated with something else that's being redefined and seen that it, it's, it's its, own, its own illness. It's usually defined as a stupor or someone who doesn't respond to stimuli. So again, falling into that almost like coma-like state. It can involve symptoms that aren't commonly associated. So some other symptoms are inability to respond. So it looks like you're awake, your eyes are open, but you're not able, you're not responding to stimulus. You're unable to speak or you're you're not speaking. Resistance to somebody touching them or adjusting them. So uh, you don't, it's almost like a reaction to being physically touched. Laying or sitting in a strange way that looks uncomfortable. So think of something that would be like, and again, not necessarily like a feigning, but that your body doesn't respond like it normally should. Agitation can also be a symptom of catatonia. That was a new one for me. Um, Strange movements and also mimicking people. I thought that was interesting. And I think that's where we got some of the connections with um, schizophrenia back in the day. And this can last for hours or years. uh, So there's no real set time limit for that. The causes of, of catatonia, catatonic depression are, are still something that's being studied. It's commonly associated with mood or psychotic disorders like depression, bipolarism, or schizophrenia. So there is still that link to schizophrenia, but it is its own entity. Uh, it can also be from physical issues. Um, Parkinson's disease uh, can bring on that. Uh, encephalitis, uh, uh, a swelling in the brain. A postpartum depression can also, uh, again, um, bring about the the catatonic like states, and I thought it was interesting that that kidney issues, diabetes, and thyroid can also lead to these. 
and and then again, traumatic brain injury, any kind of brain abnormalities might lead to catatonic depression. Some studies also show that it may have to do with the dopamine levels in your brain and a lack of neurotransmitters, but this is all still being studied. It can also be a side effect of certain medicines, especially other medicines for mental illness. So, you know, I'm on meds for this other, you know, this other problem. Maybe I'm taking meds for bipolarism, but the way the the medicine interacts with my brain chemistry can cause catatonic depression. It usually can be diagnosed if a patient exhibits three of those symptoms uh, in severity. The goal is to treat the cause or underlying issues through medicine. Uh, Another treatment that is only in severe cases as electroconvulsive therapy or ECT. Uh, it can also ebb and flow like a lot of other forms of depression. So some days might be better and then things get worse. There is a right to prevent uh, defense is protected by the Sixth Amendment uh, and California Rule 4.130 in the mental competency proceedings. So this all kind of goes in with, with the idea of him being sent to treatment in order for him to be able to take part in his own trial, like you said, in his own trial as a, as a part of it. That's guaranteed under our California Constitution. So about 10 months later, the state mental hospital where Mercado was getting treatment said that they feel he was now competent to stand trial. He went back to the San Diego Central Jail and had a competency hearing, which was in December. And on December 14th, 2015, so just short of two years of the killing, a judge ruled that Mercado was competent to stand trial. I guess during this trial, they talked a lot about his stay at the hospital. Mm -hmm. They spoke of how he was swimming, playing pool, and having relationships with people. When he would meet with the doctors, he would say that he was hearing voices, and it wasn't consistent with his actions. Also, I guess there was a tape conversation with his family that seemed to help the judge make his ruling. So I guess his family would come visit, and they taped. It just didn't seem— So you're saying that the, that the judge said, based on what I'm hearing from the doctors, even though you're saying you're still hearing voices and, and, and with these other symptoms— that the judge and the doctors are saying that's not the case. We find you 100% competent to stand trial. Right. So I don't know if, because I'm not going to make assumptions. I'm just, was he faking it the whole time? Was he really feeling that? And then in the hospital started feeling better and they said he's ready. Right. Was he feeling better? He was like that. Was he feeling better, but he was scared to go to trial. So he was saying he's hearing voices. I don't really know. But after 10 months, he was ready to, to get back at it. At this point, nearly two years later, the DA is somewhat guessing at a motive, and it's either a random act of violence or a road road rage incident. Now, if we didn't bring it up before, Mercado had pled not guilty this whole time, and the DA said that they will be seeking the death penalty. After all this, a judge sets the trial uh, for all the way out to April 3rd of 2017. So this is two more years, almost two more years. Yes. While wait, waiting for trial in jail, on July 26 of 2016, Mercado and another inmate were transported to the hospital under, quote, medical distress. The NBC7 said that they have a source close to the investigation saying they believe it was an overdose. Mercado stayed in the hospital all the way until August 6th before returning to jail. So that was a, that's a long hospital stay. Yeah. Now, on January 12th, Mercado changed his plea to guilty and is sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Is there any, any indication why, like, just out of the blue after this, he's going to change his plea? Yeah, I think it's all the new information that just came out. The DA had submitted all the evidence that day, and then the guilty plea was given. From those documents, everyone kind of learned a little more. One of the most fascinating things to me is that they did phone pinging on everyone's phone and found that they were never in the same place at the same time for a whole year prior. To me, that's just San Diego has a lot of people. It's also it's a big place, but it's also a small world, like we're always told. Mm -hmm. And to not be in the same place, but living in the same area for a whole entire year. I just think that's. Kind of, you think about it, you, never, you can't really 
figure it out yourself, but it's just kind of fascinates me. So what you're saying then is the, the law enforcement is pinging Mercado's phone and saying that he's never in the same spot as any of the three, the three murder victims. So that, because I know earlier on you were talking about the idea of the, of the whole drug connection being, uh, if it was a drug connection and Mercado was somehow connected to them, then he would have had to have been connected to, to see him either in person or there would be some connections there for a year. So you're saying that Mercado has no connections to these people at all as far as the police know. Right. Yeah, that is. Just to not be in the same place anywhere for a whole year in the same area. I just think it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It also sounds like Mercado would do some insurance fraud stuff. He had a history of accidents with his motorcycle and that he would try to fleece money from other drivers. Mm -hmm. So this motorcycle came into play also with how the DA thinks this played out. They still don't know why the murders happened, but they believe Mercado pulled up on his motorcycle. Something happened where he kills Gianni and takes his car. They believe he comes back later to get his motorcycle. That's when Sal and Alona see him pull up in Gianni's car, and he kills them both. So he left the motorcycle there and and fled again. So he kills Gianni, goes away, comes back, sees them, kills them, but then he leaves in the car again. When I went back over all the footage from that, like, the first night or the morning like we talked about way back then, mm-hmm. I couldn't see a motorcycle, so probably it wasn't parked anywhere that close in right. the shot. It was a big kind of angled shot, but I couldn't see a motorcycle. I saw something that might have been parked that might have been a motorcycle, but it was hard to tell. So supposedly, after all the investigators left the mall scene the next day, Mercado rented a U-Haul and went and picked up his motorcycle there it, that was still there. Two days later, he staged a fake motorcycle accident. I guess the insurance guy handling the claim didn't believe him, but he still paid him out $2,539. Jeez. And there's still the, the frustrating thing right now is like, that's the end. You usually have an ending, and there's still no real motive. And that's pretty much how this story ends. Even though he pled guilty. They still don't have a, a a motive. Right. It feels like a lot of times this could be me watching too much television or something. But when you've got like a death penalty case mm. and then you you plead guilty to no, to avoid the death penalty, you right. usually have to tell what happens. And it doesn't sound like that happened here. Now, is he uh, he is convicted? Well, what what it was just like we were talking about. The DA comes and tells all this new information that I just told, and then saying that they're going to take this as a death penalty case, mm-hmm. or you know, and then after the DA tells everything, the lawyer comes back and saying, "Hey, he wants to switch to pleading guilty." Mm-hmm. So it was after he heard all this information. Ah, that... But the the hardest part is they don't have a motive. No one has. The family cannot. They they put him in jail for justice, if you will, but. The family still doesn't have closure of what happened. Right. There's no, and 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 the sad thing is they probably never will. Because what excuse, what story are you going to give that those families to justify or explain the taking away of their loved ones? And I think right. that's that's the insidiousness to me of the story. Is we've talked a lot about some terrible terrible things that have went on some terrible tragedies and murders and kidnappings and things like that and i won't say that there's there's never a reason for it obviously but i think sometimes by by finding what the motive of the killer was or or the 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 criminal what what was going on in their head it does book in the story a little bit i won't say it will give us closure and again i'm we're not we're not involved in it but as an outsider, it, it feels satisfying is the wrong term, but it, it feels like a complete story. I think that's that's the hard one is is this person, for whatever reason we may never know, killed three people for no reason. Right. It almost feels like you have the person in prison for life, but it almost still feels like an unsolved case. Right. Because you don't know how the you know how they died, you know who did it. But you have no reason why. Right, and it's, exactly. It's really hard, and it. I would 
that must be so hard still every day for the family Mm -hmm. every day yeah i i I don't know i don't know that's a this one's a tougher one to, to process yeah For tonight's cold case, the information comes directly from San Diego 7's page under the section San Diego's Unsolved Cold Cases by Monica Garski. San Diego County Sheriff's homicide detectives are renewing their efforts to find out who killed 18-year-old William Napoleon Gibbs a decade ago. On March 19, 2005, deputies found Gibbs shot in a driveway in the 8,000 block of Lemon Grove Way. Witnesses say Gibbs was talking to two other men in front of an apartment complex when they were approached by two more men with guns. Gibbs was fatally shot while trying to run away, while the suspects took off on foot. In 2005, the first suspect was described as dark-skinned, 18-year-old man standing 6 feet tall and weighing about 185 pounds. He had a short haircut and goatee and was wearing a red-hooded sweatshirt and blue jeans. The second suspect was described as dark-skinned, 18-year-old man, standing 5 feet 10 inches and weighing 160 pounds. He had a short haircut as well, was clean-shaven, and wore a gray hoodie sweatshirt with blue jeans. If you know anything about this case, call the homicide detail at 858-974-2321 or Crime Stoppers at 888-580-588. 8477. Thank you for listening to this episode of California True Crime. For a full list of our sources as well as more information on the case, head over to our website at californiatruecrime.com. You can also f- support the show by finding a link to our Patreon on this page, which has the option of ad free episodes as well as finding a link to our new web store where we have California True Crime merchandise for sale. If you'd like to contact us, or you can always find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Cali True Crime. Uh, Join our Facebook discussion group where we post up questions and get feedback from our group and chat. Uh, If you enjoyed the episode, please leave us a review. Make sure you hit subscribe as well. We'd like to thank our quality control engineer, Melanie Duncan. This was recorded at The Hangar and Snail Ranch Studios. This is a production of Way Grimace.